Tom here from Warren Systems, and I've been reviewing this switch for a little bit longer than expected, but that works out better for you. Full disclosure up front, this was sent to me by Ingenious. They said, hey, Tom, what do you think of this? So, well, I started setting it up, plugging it in, set up some VLANs on it, and it's PoE switch, so I powered some cameras off of it. And uh, yeah, so far it worked really well. I actually ended up testing it for a little bit longer than expected. It's been plugged in and running at my house for probably, well, studio, I should say, more specifically powering the cameras at my studio in my house for about two months now and uh, haven't had any problems. So too long, didn't watch, it works fine. Specifically, what model is this? Well, this is an ingenious ECS 2512 FP. This has eight two and a half gig PoE ports and four 10 gig SFP. P plus ports, has VLAN support, Mac-based LECL support, PoE++ with a 240 watt power budget, and that's all eight of these ports right here, supports leak aggregation, all the usual features. This is not a layer three switch though, so there is no routing functionality. It's just, you know, VLAN aware switch, LLDP aware switch. So if you want to set it up for phones and power those or power cameras or power access points off it, good for all of those. And it supports SNMP monitoring. So it does have some basic monitoring functions as well as can connect to the Ingenious Cloud. So we're gonna go over the basic settings of this switch and already you know it's worked out so well, I haven't had any problems with it, but we'll show you what the web interface looks like on it and then we'll attach it to their cloud interface and give you an idea how that works. You do not have to attach this to the cloud. This is a switch that can work independently with its own web interface and never have to be attached to the cloud. It's an optional feature, so we won't spend too much time on the cloud features. It's actually just more or less reproducing most of the web interface into the cloud. We'll talk about the VLAN setup because the firmware on this was updated all of two days ago on June 19th, 2022. And because of that, uh, the interface looks a little different than when I first got it. Uh, there's been actually a couple different firmware updates on there. So if you were to go through their documentation, as of today in June, 2022, you will realize that that documentation is well, still shows all the old settings on there in terms of the way they used to lay it out. Uh, there's a few UI elements that they're easily overlooked. I'll show you when you're setting this up. So it may hopefully save some people on some confusion. Everything's time indexed down below so you can jump to the part that is most relevant to you. Before we get into details of this video, let's first. Are you an individual or company looking for support on a network engineering, storage, or virtualization project? Is your company or internal IT team looking for someone to proactively monitor your system security or offer strategic guidance to keep your IT systems operating smoothly? Not only would we love to help consult on your project, we also offer fully managed or co-managed IT service plans for businesses in need of IT administration or IT teams in need of additional support. With our expert install team, we can also assist you with all of your structured cabling and Wi-Fi planning projects. If any of this piques your interest, fill out our Hire Us form at lawrencesystems.com so we can start crafting a solution that works for you. If you're not interested in hiring us, but you're looking for other ways you want to support this channel, there's affiliate links down below to get you deals and discounts on products and services we talk about on this channel. And now back to our content. Now we're going to start here at the product page, the Cloud Managed 8 port 240 PoE++ multi gigabit 2.5 gig switch with four SFP plus uplink ports. And I want to note that the Cloud Manage, as I said at the beginning, is an option, not a requirement. These do not have to be connected to the cloud system that Ingenious has. It has a local interface. Taking a quick closer look at the switch and the product itself, though, it's pretty basic. Not a lot to look at here. We have the eight ports that are front that are two and a half gig and the four SFP plus ports and the one console port. And there's a little reset button buried in there. And if you notice when you look off to the side of the switch here, it is not passively cool, but has two fans in there that are not that loud. I wouldn't want it sitting on a desk next to me, but it if it was, it was not really that loud, and it's certainly by far not the loudest thing in my rack. Standard power connector on the back. Now, we will be covering the cloud interface, but I thought I'd start with the local unadopted interface. There is a default password that was set. I did change it. If you don't change it, it bugs you to do so, so do change the default password. Now, here, and we'll zoom in to make it a little easier to read here on YouTube, you have the model name, you have the IP address, subnet mask. It by default is set to DHCP, which is greatly convenient. You plug it in, it'll grab an address. And I usually leave things at DHCP and statically assign them via reservations. But on this dashboard, you have a glance that there's only one device plugged in right now to port two using about three watts of power. We have two VLANs defined. We will cover how to define another VLAN, but I left this one set up because I was testing cameras with it. Now we'll go over here to the config, system settings, 
pretty basic setup here. You can rename it. You can give it a system location, a system contact. Who should you contact if this has got a problem? You can put that information in there. Defaults to management on VLAN 1, but that can be changed. Uh, by the way, the web interface is accessible on both port 80 and port 443. So FYI, those are accessible on VLAN 1 by default unless you change it. Now, it does offer IPv6. Then you have all your usual settings here, ARP table, system time, which is default to be set from a uh, NTP server. So scroll back up here. A couple other options, including a couple that I don't know what they are. So we have this FitCon IP address that both searching for and reading the manual did not really lend me any information to what it was. I didn't contact them on this particular thing. I did contact them on what we'll talk about next. And you can see all the VLAN settings here, but we'll jump to port settings because this is where I have a little bit of confusion that they didn't reply in a clear way. Here's those ports, one through eight, and then the SFP ports, which are nine through 12. And then here's these ports, T1, T2, T3, T4, all the way to T8. I thought they stood for trunk port. I did message them. They said, no, it didn't, but they didn't say what it stood for. So I still don't know what these ports do or what they are. Uh, they don't seem to need to be changed or anything to uh, do anything. I, they don't show up because I right now have port one is set to auto and it's connected at one gig. And this one's set to auto and one gig, which is accurate in what they're connected to. Uh, these just say link down all the time and I don't know how to get them to link up. Maybe there's some feature I'm just not aware of, but the manual nor the person sent me the switch could answer exactly what that did. And I just leave it at that. Now it does have port isolation, mirror, jumbo frame support, LODP settings are here, local device, remote device. This is actually kind of interesting. Uh, there's an option in the cloud platform to add more than your standard phones for the LODP, which I thought was kind of interesting that you could do that. So if you have something that you still want to be assigned auto through LDP, which it uses the MAC address to determine if it's a phone device and automatically assigns that, you can look up more details of how LDP works. It's a standard protocol, but it's uh, kind of cool that they have that as an option, but I only seen that in the cloud, not here locally. Now let's go down the list here. Uh, power supply. And you can set the budget, total power budget. You can set it to be less than, and I don't know why you would, but you can in case you want to make sure that this uh, can be not overdone, not that it should be overdone. If it supports 240, it should stay at 240. Maybe it's just for setting some of the warnings. I didn't really get an absolute clear answer on that. Now for this here, it's kind of interesting because you can go to the PoE port settings and you can edit. For example, this is delivering single and we can say priority low, medium, high great state on or off or uh, user defined and set a limit for that particular port where you don't want this to use any more than this particular amount of wattage so you can set it to six watts you could say don't use more than 10 watts on this particular port uh, so it gives you a little bit of fine grain control over that and for anyone wondering or wants to read the manual I'll leave a link to it but this is how the manual looks total power budget i don't know the total amount of the power switch can provide on all ports consume power displays total amount of power that's it. It doesn't tell me exactly what that does. Otherwise, there's a little bit of documentation here about it, but it doesn't really give me more information of why I would set it lower. Now, before we get to the VLAN settings, I'll mention that it does have this option in here, but it's not on the spec sheet. It does offer static routes for layer three. I didn't try these. I just found it odd that they show up here because, well, when I look through the book and I look through the specs on the site, it didn't say it supported this. So I'll work under the assumption that this is just there for looks and doesn't actually do anything. I didn't realize I spent a lot of time trying to configure uh, things that don't appear to work in here. But yeah, it does. It picks up this route right here for the DHCP gateway. But yeah, kind of odd the way that works. But we do have other things like IGMP snooping in here as well. Uh, and then we'll go down to QoS. I didn't do a lot of testing on there, but it does offer QoS options on here. So that, that was in the list of things that it says it can do, setting the ingress or egress rate limits and storm control on the different ports. But let's look at the VLANs now. All right, so let's create some VLAN settings and we'll zoom in a little to make this easy. Walk through the process. First, give it a VLAN ID, 1337. We'll call it testing and we'll hit apply. This creates the VLAN 
part in terms of like the tag and the virtual ID, then we actually have to start doing all the other parts that are a little bit unclear on their documentation. And there's a couple of ways to do it. You can click this and just type in the port. Our trunk port is one. So that's our port where the tags are coming in. Make sure you check the little box next to it. Then you can click here. This is where we're going to untag in on port eight. You can click the edit or you can click the ports and they'll tell you it would be an untagged port. No problem. Enabled. And then we hit the checkbox here. Then we click apply. If you don't click apply and you click to another screen, it will lose those settings. Now, as I said, just to give a brief intro here, this right here, and we had to set these as untagged to let the ports come in on VLAM one. And then we have on the camera, we'll close this one here on the camera because we want the trunk port, which is port one to bring in VLAN tag 60. And we want it to bring in VLAN tag 1337. Then we want those VLAN tags to be coming out of ports three and four for my camera and port eight for our testing device here. Kind of gets you an idea. It's a little confusing, but we're not done yet to actually activate. So those ports work. Then you have to set the PVID of the port. So we go to this other page. And now that we defined it and have the port set, we're going to go over here and we're going to click edit. And we're going to change it to 1337 access type all. You can actually get more granular here. I'm not going to get into every little detail about it, but you get the idea that except type all, or in this case, we're bringing it down to only this particular VLAN. It's just a little confusing to me how they decided it needed to be on a couple pages. And here's those ports again, T1 through T8 that you can also add these to, but I don't know what they do, as I said earlier in the video. So that's how you do VLANs in here. And if you're thinking it's easier if you attach it to the cloud, nope, it's actually the same. The nice thing is when you look at things like this uh, table right here, you can kind of get an overview of what ports are tagged and untagged as you stack all of your VLANs on here. I'm hoping they will update their documentation, but as of June 2022, and I did reach out to them about this, uh, their documentation is not 100% great on this, that you have to set both of these to get that working. Now, the final couple things I'll mention is it does have under security 802.11x access and port security options. I did not spend time testing or set up a radius server with this. I just don't have the time to go that in depth with this particular switch. I just wanted to test the basic functions and the functions listed in there, which is, as I said, why I skipped the layer three. Odd that it shows up in there, but according to the documentation and a manual, it's not a supported function to set up static routes inside of this. Now, before we log into the cloud interface, I want to mention they have this free versus pro license. And there's a lot of details in here. I'm not going to spend too much time on it because it's pretty well documented here what you get or what you don't get unless you have the pro license. And there's a Q&A and there's a whole learn more about pro features and they go into why you should have a pro license. You just get some basic functionality with the free version. But I'll also mention like if you want priority support, that's part of what they're trying to upsell you on with the pro. So if you want their assistance, want their support, that's something they have. I did not see the pricing available in here. They have a couple different things that maybe I could Google around and find it, but it kind of dates the video because prices are always subject to change. But this is what that site looks like in June of 2022. Now, this is what their cloud interface looks like right now. And you can see I have one of my switches in there and we're going to click it on dark mode because thank you, Ingenious, for at least having dark mode right at the top and easy to get to. How do you add things in there? It's actually pretty simple. You're going to go here and click register device. You're going to scan it or drop the serial number in. That is really simple to do because the system by default beacons out to their cloud once it gets online. You can block it. It doesn't seem to affect the device at all if you do so. But if you do decide to, uh, you know, register a cloud, you just drop this in there and unblock it, if you will, or just let it get out to the internet and it will automatically start adding the devices in there. It does require a password or that you know the password to actually get the access level in there as well. So you can't just randomly add people's serial numbers because I tested that. Now, once you have these in inventory, you click assign to network. I've already built a network called Tom Studio and we click apply. I have good news. If you went through all the pain of setting up that VLAN, it works just the same inside of here because it copies the VLAN settings. You don't have to do it again when you register these to the cloud. That cloud registration will have the switch showing up over here in the dashboard in a moment. All right, now that we have the switch online, and don't worry, that's not my public WAN IP, but it does tell you what IP address this is coming from. And it gives you this kind of simple interface right here to let you rename the switch. I like that it's got these little blink lights right here to kind of show you what it's doing for VLAN 1. 
or VLAN 60 or to VLAN 1337. So it kind of gives you an easy overview. Uh, the uptime is actually interesting because it is the uptime of the switch, not how long it's been in the cloud. So it did not reset or unprovision my local settings, reboot the switch to adopt it. It's just simply in the cloud now. From there, most things are pretty much the same. I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on here because, well, I don't have any SSIDs or anything else, but let's go back over to VLAN settings. And does this interface look familiar? If we can click on it, we can name it here. So this is still where you define the VLANs. And then we're gonna go back over to switch settings and you have all your LLDP settings, your voice VLAN. Uh, by the way, this was interesting. And as I think I'd mentioned, you can add different um, OUI addresses and descriptions if you wanna add things that weren't already in that LLDP option. So I think that's kind of nice that they have that extended features in there. Let's go over to VLANs itself now, which can be a little bit confusing because you can't get to them from where you think you'd be able to under VLAN settings. You actually go back over here to the dashboard, you go to the switch, and you're going to click on details. Then you can adjust the details of the actual switch. And then we have our VLAN settings again, like we had over there where we could define them. That defines them globally, this defines them specific to the switch. And then there's our port configuration, and there is the option to click that, click configure and do all the adjustment on a per port setting. It's slightly different than the way it looks inside of the local interface. So it aggregates a few different things together, like differently, but not really that much different. So it's just a kind of moving and shuffling around things. And by the way, we're gonna go switch over to our local interface again, and you can still define things over here. So we can still go back over and uh, set our VLAN settings and VLAN tables right here, so I can still add more things. And if I add them here, it'll refresh and show up in the web interface. So I like that they let you go back and forth between both. Uh, that is an option they actually had added to this particular system. It wasn't there before. There was an option somewhere buried in here that they turned on that allow you to locally manage it at the same time. Kind of interesting, because it's not an easy one to find. I found it once, uh, but didn't find it again. Yeah, I don't know where it is or if that setting is now gone. It was an option they did have though. So it allowed for local management, but I can't find it anymore. Um, I'm just being as honest as I can about the way this interface works because it is definitely um, a bit of confusion. For example, let's add, you know, one, two, three, four, another test. And we'll show how that shows up. Once again, you can do it here. Then we go back over here to dashboard or I imagine you can probably just go right to the switches and you just want to go to the details and then we can add that other VLAN we added. There's just a few different ways that they could have made the interface, in my opinion, a little bit better, but I just wanted to highlight that it's possible to do all these things on here, but it is also a few extra clicks to get them done and some things aren't actually clickable. So we actually got to click on a port. Let's use port seven for this one. And uh, then we can go through and label it, set the speed duplex, choose the VLAN settings, so on and so forth. But you still have over here, here's an, that other test right here. And you still, even though you can do those, this interface is still important for doing the part where you set up the different tags on there. So if we choose it, we just choose this port right here. So it's very grayed out, but yes, we wanna choose that. It's gonna come in on our trunk port and we wanted to use port seven. So you click on this little part here and we click eight. Then we click that, we're gonna, check see another test what we actually don't want it on part eight we wanted this one on port seven so let me edit that seven hit the checkbox hit apply and you still have to assign and tag it over here now that just pushed it down to the switch so it's still a little bit of the nuance i think they could do a better job on this i'm saying this because i'm hoping people at ingenious are watching me click through these interfaces and hoping saying yeah that could be done a little better as many of the audience may be doing as well a few final comments on this switch and things I didn't mention earlier. Yes, I did try some different adapters in the SFP+. Plus. It doesn't seem to care what brand the adapters are. And I did try this RJ45 QSFP SFP+, Plus, QSFP Tech, not a QSFP adapter. Don't, don't get those confused. Uh, but I've used this before in a couple other demos. This had no problem working uh, and it will allow for a 10 gig connection between the device. I also tried these Ubiquiti 
uh, SFP plus fiber modules. These work perfectly fine in it as well. It didn't seem to care. Um, so it doesn't appear to have any vendor lock-in on the SFP, SFP plus ports on here. Other thoughts, what about VLAN hopping? Because that comes up every now and then. I did lock down one of the ports to a specific VLAN and tried to get back to the management interface by statically assigning an IP on the system because this worked and does probably work on some of the other um, switches out there that exist. It's a really simple test that should not pass. I think it was a TP-Link switch. I have in an old video where I showed it working years ago. Uh, but no, that didn't work on this particular switch. Now, as I said in the beginning, this was sent to me by Ingenious. I have a full contents ethics policy. This was not a paid endorsement by them. They did send me this unit for review. Uh, the opinions are all here my own and not those of Ingenious, but I did contact their support, as I said earlier in the video, and ask them questions about why the VLAN tags or what those T ports are and a couple other things that I just don't really have an answer to um, because it's not in the documentation and they didn't really answer that particular question, but I was able to configure it without that knowledge. Um, so take that for what it's worth. It's not a bad switch. It's been running for a few months, pushing my cameras. It never gave me any trouble. It went through all the firmware updates that were set to be automatically done when I had it attached to the cloud. It did those firmware updates. It occasionally surprised me because at 2 a.m. when I told it to do the updates, which is a setting you can control, uh, it also, when you're powering your cameras, sets off a tamper alarm at 2 a.m. that someone's messing with your cameras. That's how I knew the switch was updating. But the updates went smooth. It always came back online. Um, it just made all my cameras go out that were attached to it briefly because, you know, they lose connection while it reboots and updates firmware. It's a pretty minor inconvenience. I do like the fact that it has auto firmware update because we know there's plenty of things out there that never get firmware updates. It is a uh, easy setting. Actually, I think the default setting on the cloud was on for the firmware updates. I'll leave links to everything I mentioned down below, including a link where you can purchase this over on Amazon if you're so interested in it. I'll leave your comments and thoughts down below or head over to our forums for a more in-depth discussion. Thanks. And thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. If you've enjoyed the content, please give us a thumbs up. If you would like to see more content from this channel, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon. If you'd like to hire a sure project, head over to lawrencesystems.com and click the Hire Us button right at the top. To help this channel out in other ways, there's a Join button here for YouTube and a Patreon page where your support is greatly appreciated. For deals, discounts, and offers, check out our affiliate links in the description of all of our videos, including a link to our shirt store where we have a wide variety of shirts that we sell and designs come out, well, randomly, so check back frequently. And finally, our forums. Forums.lawrencesystems.com is where you can have a more in-depth discussion about this video and other tech topics covered on this channel. Thanks again for watching and look forward to hearing from you.